Danny Gorog is from Outwear Mobile. Danny's going to be talking about the value of mobile applications and why you should consider investing. So would you please join me in welcoming Danny Gorog to the stage. Hello everyone. My name is Danny Gorog and I'm from a company called Outwear Mobile. Um, just to give you a bit of context, we work with Steve Lorimer to build the Hort uh, Finder application. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about who we are, the sort of apps we've built. Uh, I'm going to try and cover a lot in 20 minutes. Uh, yeah, who we are, the sort of apps we've built, why I think you should start thinking about building mobile apps and then once you're actually thinking about and building mobile apps, the sort of things to look out for based on our experience of um, bringing quite a few apps to market. So just quickly, um, we specialise in mobile app strategy, design and development. That's all we do. We, uh, we don't do websites, we don't do social media, we just build um, mobile apps. We started about two and a half years ago and we spent most of our time building apps for the iPhone iOS, um, but from about, uh, probably about 12 months ago there's been quite a lot of interest in Android apps as well, so we're now building Android apps and um, actually we've done a mobile web app for the Department of Justice, but I'll talk a bit about that soon. So just to kind of recap the sort of stuff we've done in the last uh, 12 months. We've built, tested and released over 30 apps. Um, our clients include the Department of Primary Industries, Herald Sun, News Limited, EPA, Department of Justice, Bicycle Victoria, Tourism Victoria, Penguin Census, and the list kind of goes on. Um, cumul cumulatively, our apps, we've had over 140,000 downloads, 700 plus customer reviews on the App Store. Um, many of our apps are rated four plus stars. Um, there was a recent promotion, I think it's still on the, on the App Store, highlighting Australian apps. Um, six of our apps were featured in there out of a total of 70 apps, so that was pretty good. Um, we've launched an app in the Sydney Apple Store with Margaret Fulton, um, and we've won Create Design Award, and we actually just won another award a couple of weeks ago. Um, that's kind of a, a list, hopefully you've seen some of the apps that we've made. I wanted to, to touch on just a couple of them which I think are pretty interesting. This app is called Snaps and Solve, and we built it in response to a government, a Victorian government competition about using publicly available data to come up with some sort of novel application. So we came up with Snaps and Solve and we've got over 20,000 users across Australia. What it does, it lets you very easily um, pull out your phone, um, take a photo of an issue that you might have seen that is relevant to the council, so graffiti or a problem with play equipment in a park or problem with the roads or really anything and send it to the council very quickly. So we built a system in the back end, so a web service that um, has all the LGA information and we know by your GPS which LGA you, you, you are in. We send that information down to the phone and then you can send the council a message very quickly. Um, there's an Android app available now, four star rating on the App Store, Create Des Design Award and, and I think it's really opened a lot of doors for, for our business. We've actually used part of the technology in the DPI app that we created so we make it really easy to send reports. This is another one which is pretty interesting and just sort of talks I think to the power of mobile devices. This is an app which we've just finished um, a couple of months ago. It's designed to replace, you know, when you get in a cab and you see those big terminals and the meters and lots of stuff, $30,000 of equipment in most cabs. So this company has designed uh, an, an Android app that basically replaces all that equipment. So it uses GPS to work out the distance. Um, it talks in real time to their dispatcher system via quite an old protocol called UDP. Um, it, uh, it even captures user signatures when the, when the journey is finished. So we think this is, and that, we think and they think this is the future of uh, mobile apps. You know, they're now sourcing reasonably cheap tablets out of China, three, four hundred dollar tablets out of China that they're going to install this on and chuck in the cabs versus thirty thousand dollars of equipment that's hard to maintain. So that's that's where this sort of stuff's going. Um, the Hort Service Finder is the app that we built for the DPI. Um, let's uh, growers find nearby um, service providers. Uh, it was a joint project between 16 grow associations and the DPI and I said before we use Snaps and Solve um, information to send information to providers uh, and it's well integrated with uh, the website. So the topic of my talk, um, what is the value of mobile applications and why should you invest in them? 
So I think one of the big deals about mobile apps and, and mobile technology is they let you reach users wherever they are. So if they're in the field or if they're in the office or, or if they're commuting, everyone has a mobile phone with them all the time. So it's really the only device that users have with them all the time and, and it's the device you should be targeting if you want to interact with users. We think that mobile apps let you improve the user experience and I'll, I'll give you a, an example. We're about to release this app for the EPA. It's called Litter Reporter. And um, it's all about letting users on the road report litter incidents. So you see someone throw a cigarette butt out of the car. Um, in the old days, you, you, you would probably note down their number plate on a little scrap of paper you had in the car and get home. And if you still, um, still can be bothered and you still can remember, you'd probably go to the website and you might download a form and you'd print the form out. Then you'd fill out the form and then you'd have to find a fax machine and you'd fax it back to them. And you know, three hours later, you've actually submitted a request and they will then issue a fine. So we thought um, mobile apps are the perfect, this is a perfect solution for this, to, to, to make this a, an easier process for the user. So this app now lets you enter a rego number very quickly, so you just tap, tap down the rego number, save it for later, and then when you've got time you go through a series of steps on the app to enter the information, press submit, and that information electronically goes to the EPA, goes into their system, and a fine is generated. So that's, that's, that's where we're going to get to. Uh, this is coming out in the next month or so. But I think part of the process for the EPA was actually taking this long form that they had on paper and kind of getting rid of stuff that they didn't need. And sometimes you need a project like a mobile app to work out what's really important because you keep going along and you've got history and you, we did it before so we're going to do it like that again. But with mobile apps you really have to force yourself to really look at it and refine the user experience to create a good product. And so I guess on that, we think that apps let you um, collect better, more relevant data in real time. So instead of asking a person where they were, you just get the GPS lat long um, and an accuracy detail report so that the user doesn't have to think about it and your report is always going to be correct. A an example of this is um, an app we built for, it's called the Bicycle Network and it's called Ridealog. It's been out, this, this is the second version which is coming out soon and uh, it's, a trip, it's a free trip computer for cyclists. And um, I guess cyclists use it, they press start at the start of their trip, they put their phone in their pocket, they ride to work and they press stop at the end of it. It's a really beautiful computer, it tells them how far they rode, uh, how fast, altitude, can show them all that information on a map. But it also anonymously uploads that information to a server that we, we wrote for the Bicycle Network which aggregates that data. And so what the Bicycle Network now do is they take that data on aggregate and they can see the flows of traffic through different suburbs and through the city and they take that and they sell it or they give it to councils to help councils improve cycling facilities. So it's a real example of using mobile technology in the real world to improve an outcome and uh, we think that's where the, the magic in, in mobiles is. So I think the, 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 over, uh, the overriding points to, to take out of this are Smartphones are getting smarter and more useful over time. Have, has anyone seen the new iPhone 4S? Does Siri, have you talked about Siri? I'm just going to give you a quick demo because I think it's interesting to see. Siri is a new technology that Apple, uh, Apple actually bought a company that uh, does this. It's not just voice recognition, it's actually artificial intelligence. And uh, I'll just plug it into my phone and uh, we'll see what happens. So I should be able to, so there's my phone. And you hold down the, um, hold down the home button and you can make a call. So I might just say, um, call Lindy's mobile. Right. Okay, so that's my wife, right? But then I can also do stuff like, tell Lindy I'm running five minutes late. And I could just say send and that would send it. Okay, I can do stuff like, Remind me to call Steve tomorrow when I get to the office. Here's your reminder for tomorrow at 9 a.m. Okay. Uh, you can do stuff like, how tall is Mount Everest? Let me check that for you. I found this for you. Right, so, and then you can do other cool stuff like, how many miles in 2,426 kilometres? Let me think. <laughs> okay, here goes. So there you go. So this is all stuff that you can do much faster with voice 
um, as opposed to actually using your fingers to tap around. So if you think about this sort of technology in the field, you know, what, where is this going to go? So these are the things to start thinking about. It's also got some, a bit of personality, so you can say stuff like, will you marry me? So yeah, that's Siri. Uh, I haven't checked, but you should ask her. Just to my point of smartphones are getting smarter over time, that's really what it's about. So this is, you know, you, this is week one of Siri, where's it, where's it going to be in four years' time or where's it going to be in ten years' time? This is stuff that um, companies like Apple and Google are, are very focused on and, and you should think about these in the, in, the, in the context of where your mobile app can go. And I think starting, <clears throat> starting early to gain exposure and experience is very important. We see at Outware, we see apps as not a destination but a journey. And uh, often you want to do this many things in, in your app and we try to convince you to just do a couple of them, pick the really important ones, do them really well and see how they go. And if they've gone well, you then keep building on. Um, if they haven't gone well, then you, maybe you need to change tack. <clears throat> this is a question that we get asked a lot, uh, why are native apps better than mobile websites? Um, we think that um, they offer the user a better and more reliable experience. From our perspective, it's all about delivering a great experience for the user and we think you can do that better as a, as a mobile app um, as opposed to a website. They, we think they're easy to find. I think people know about going to the App Store and doing a search for ANZ or DPI. People actually know where to go. With the web, it's kind of potluck. You know, you need to have good search engine optimization if you're going to list yourself on Google. And we just think that users are more familiar with the, the App Store concept now. Um, they're faster to start, so you know you can store a lot of data locally in the app, so you don't have to poll the network all the time. Think about if you go to the footy and trying to get on a network connection at the footy, it's it's almost impossible. Um, and they can run in the background, so stuff like Ride Log sits away in the background while you're doing other things and keeps tracking your GPS and can upload to the server. So things that websites can't do. Now, websites may be able to do that in the future, but they're always going to be behind the, the native mobile technology. And I guess to, to counter that, why are native apps worse than websites? Well, they're more expensive to build. If you're going to build, if you want to build for all platforms, if you want to build for iPhone and Android and Blackberry and Nokia, you're really going to be shelling out basically the same amount every time um, because they're all written in different languages. They've all got slightly different uh, UI, user interface um, variables or, or languages. Um, there is a little bit of common ground between apps. So if you do a design, the design is normally usable across multiple platforms, but it normally does need to be tweaked. But in terms of the actual code that you're writing to build your app, you have to write that in different languages for the different platforms. Um, we, we, we developed an app for the Department of Justice called The Daily List, which lets um, people who go to the courts very easily download um, information about who's, on, who's, who's on at which court and when. And um, that was, it's been a really great success for the Department of Justice and they wanted to extend that to other platforms um, because they felt that having it as an iOS only app excluded people, and which, is, which is true. Um, so the, the choice they've made is to actually build a mobile web app of that, um, of that iPhone app so it's available now as a web app. Um, so we think the hybrid app, app approach may be best. You know, we think that develop first for iPhone still because we still think it's the most um, successful platform, it's, uh, it's the most capable pl platform and if your idea succeeds on, on the iPhone it'll probably succeed everywhere else. If it doesn't succeed on the iPhone it probably won't succeed anywhere else. So it's a good, um, good benchmark. And then if, you, if you've got the budget, go and build another native app for Android or uh, go and build an iPad app or if you don't have the budget maybe think about building some sort of mobile web application. Should you build an app? So these are questions I'd ask myself if I was you know, if I thought that I wanted to build an app. Do you have a smartphone and do you have platform experience? So I think it's very important before you start thinking about an app that you actually go out and get a smartphone. Who's got, who's got a smartphone in the audience? Okay, so most people have got them. So you, you've got a smartphone, you're familiar with the App Store. If you're not familiar with the App Store, get familiar with the App Store, go and download an app, go and pay for an app, go and, go and choose a topic and pay for one app, see what the quality's like and then get a free app and see what the quality's like and have a good understanding in your head about what the platform is, how it works, because I think you need that when you're building an app. 
you've got to be able to explain to yourself what makes an app great. So is it the user interface? Is it that it gives me access to this data that I didn't have access to before? So the MetLink app, I think, is a crap app. It doesn't work well, but it gives me access to the timetables, and that's what I care about. Tram Tracker, that's a great app. The ANZ, who's got the ANZ mobile app? That is the iPhone app's superb app. So then you've got to ask yourself, has someone already built a similar app? And if so, why will yours be better? And I think in the, in the case of government apps in particular, you've got access to data generally that others don't have access to, and that's really where the power is. So you've got all this fantastic data. How do you unlock it and give it to the user? So I think you guys are in a kind of a unique position where you've, where you've got that advantage. Um, I think it's really important to think about before you start the app, how will you measure the success of the project? So is it number of downloads? Is it because you're first to market? There are a whole, whole, lot of, um, whole lot of things to think about. And then how long will you give yourself to work out whether the app's successful? Is it six months? Is it a year? You know, normally these things kind of spike at the start and then sort of decline. So how will you keep it fresh? How will you work out how long you're going to give it? Some considerations when creating a mobile app. The first part about when we build a mobile app is all about wireframing. So it's about working out what the functional elements of the app are going to be, what the buttons are going to be, what the names of the buttons are going to be, not how big the buttons will be or what shape the buttons will be, but where they'll go and what will the flow of the app be. So a user will tap here and then it'll take them to this next screen where they'll see this information or they'll tap on the information and it'll take them to another screen. So we think um, wireframes are really powerful tool to help you explore your thinking around the mobile experience and they will help you map out your app and they will you'll, you'll uncover things that you think you that you haven't thought about and you'll work out the things that you thought are probably not necessary they are also a good tool to show other people other users of the app what the app potential will do and people will be able to look at the wireframes and go yeah you know what I, this is this could be quite useful for me it's much cheaper and much faster to experiment with wireframes than it is when you get to the finished art stage. And this is some examples of the wireframes. So this is the stuff we did for DPI. So you can see the functional elements kind of laid out on the screen, the sort of information that we're going to show, the names of the headings in the tab bar. I've actually forgot the tab bar here. So once the wireframes are finished and signed off, we move through to design. Every app needs design. If you find someone who's going to build you an app and says, don't worry about it, we don't need design, tell them to go away. You don't want to work with them. Um, every app needs design. There's, there are too many great apps in the App Store for your app not to have some serious design work. And then after you've gone through those phases, you need to test the design. So what, what works for you might not work for others. You've got to consult, discuss and refine. So whether that's with industry partners or with peers or just with your wife or partner at home, you know, if everyone knows how to use an app now, so throw it at them, say, hey, what do you think of this? Does it work for you? Yeah, get your partners involved in testing your app. So once we actually build the beta of the app, we can send it around, distribute it. Lots of people can test it and provide feedback. Some general tips. This is a big one. Give yourself plenty of time. Apps don't, get, don't happen overnight. Um, I would say the average time to get an app to market is between four months if you're quick, six to eight months if you're slow. And the EPA app we've been working on now for over 12 months. And not, it's not, that's not because it's particularly complex. It's just because things take time to happen. It takes time for approvals. It takes time for changes and change approvals. Things just take time. So give yourself plenty of time. Don't commit to a release date until you can see the, see the end. Um, we think it's really important to respect the users and pay attention to feedback. You often get a lot of crummy feedback in the App Store, so comments, user comments. But... Um, there's often a lot of useful stuff in there, so it doesn't work for me when I do this or I prefer to have this information. So they're the things that you take on board and you, uh, and you put back into the process when you're doing an update or adding new features. The first app always takes, takes longer than you expect, and I had another slide which said, and the second and third do as well. But just to reiterate, it will always take you longer than you expect. This is a really important one. Um, you've probably all seen this in Angry Birds, and we do it in quite a few of our apps. So if you launch Angry Birds, I'm not sure what the number, five times, for example, it'll pop up a message to say, hey, rate, rate me now. And um, this is a really good tool to build your ratings in the App Store and because we think that the, the better rated the app, the more successful it is in terms of downloads. Um, you only want to show it sort of every fifth load, for example, because if people use your app five times, they probably like it. 
or they probably think it's useful. So that's when you ask them. You don't ask them at the first run when they've never seen the app because that's a recipe for disaster. Um, and then make it easy for them to say no thanks and never show it to them again. So respect the user. We think that updates are a really good opportunity to reconnect with, with users. So um, you know, if you've got an update or you're adding a new feature or you're changing the database or whatever you're doing, you know, you've got an opportunity where they're going to read what's new in your app and you should use that to your advantage. So hey, thanks for using the app. In this update we've delivered these new features. You know, let us know if you've got any feedback, whatever it is. I think customers appreciate that. This is also really important. So you've got to be able to track your app's performance and understand what drives downloads. We had a... Um, this is the last slide. We had uh, an app called Shop Ethical, which is an app that we've partnered with the Ethical Consumer Group on. And it was an iPhone app of the week. I think it was in June... Uh, yeah, uh, May, yeah, May, June. And um, it's really interesting. This shows you the sales history. So the what you can see the, see the vertical lines up here, what's hot on the left. So on the app store there's a couple of sections. There's kind of the, the apps of the week, then there's like what's hot and then there's staff favourites and then there are a few other promotions. So when your app gets into the what's hot section you can see the, the impact it makes on sales and then it, it sort of slowed out and then we were app of the week. So you know the top tile in the app store which is pretty cool. App of the week you saw it, it drove sales again and then it dropped off. And then we were actually featured in the, the Good Weekend had a top 100 apps and we were the editor's choice for the app of the week. And you can see that the peak is actually higher than the, the, the peak of the being featured on the app store. So actually before this I thought that the app store was, you know, was it for press. If you wanted to get your, your app known you'd go to the app store. But actually you can see that having a presence in, in the Good Weekend is, is also incredibly powerful or mass media is also incredibly powerful. Uh, and then it drops off and then we will start favourites and then it sort of dropped off. So it's really interesting to see what drives sales, the drive, drives downloads. Uh, I hear a lot of talk about social media driving downloads. I think that's still a bit new. I still think you need huge amounts of users to drive any substantial traffic um, through social media. But mass media is really important. Um, in terms of, I also, I sort of have another hat as well. I do a little bit of freelance media. So I write for Macworld and I'm on SEN and MTR each week talking on the radio. And uh, it's very important, I, you know, I get lots of press releases all the time about apps and stuff, and it's very important, I think, if you're going to do a press release an app, with an app, send screenshots. People like screenshots, and often I get press releases about apps, no screenshots, f forget about it. Uh, and then, you know, pick, find the journos who you think are the right people to speak to, whether it's, you know, if you've got Apple stuff, you'd go and talk to Gary Barker from the, you know, from the age, or whoever it is, make a phone call or send them a personal email. Um, journos like that, and that's... You build a relationship and keep them keep coming over time, get them involved in the testing early, um, and they really like that, and that's a good way to get some exposure. And that's all I have to say. It's covered a lot. <laughs>